Okay, welcome everybody to uh, week four, webcast six. Tonight, it, uh, the live webcast is going to be about bridge and links. It's going to be an extension of what we have been doing in the last webcast, which is really focusing on getting images into InDesign. That's that's when really the exciting things start to happen. And so I want to talk a little bit about Bridge. Even though Bridge I think is a more advanced topic than maybe I would have brought up for this level one class, I noticed that Cindy in her previous class went over this. So um, I, I just decided to go ahead and include it. And okay, the tab doesn't work. Okay, hey, Nissan, let me see, let me take that up with you after class if I can. Just if you could hang on after class and let's see if we can get this taken care of and resolved. And I can also Google the, the grab utility and see if that's causing any problems with InDesign. All right, I'm going to switch over to another file here. Um, this is another friend of mine who whose hobby is photography and he took these pictures of eagles in Alaska. He has some amazing pictures of these eagles. His name is Bruce Medlin and he has let me use his images for class, which I really appreciate. I'm completely enthralled by these photos and I don't know if really the, the um, resolution you're seeing them at across a webcast can really do them justice. But anyway, I'm going to use these as my examples tonight to talk about Bridge. Bridge is a picture-based utility program that allows you to view, open, and manage Creative Suite documents and associated graphics and files, which we often refer to as assets. And the really nice thing about Bridge is that it allows you to preview Adobe application files without opening that application. And there are going to be two ways that we're going to talk about accessing these bridge features. One is we're going to launch the standalone program. And you can, there's a button for that in InDesign, Photoshop, Illustrator. And it's right up here at the top next to the Zoom. It's a little tiny icon that says BR. And if you hover over it, it'll say go to bridge. And then very recently we got a mini bridge. Sounds like something that you drink. Um, but it allows you to create a similar environment right within InDesign as a panel, which is really kind of cool. But we're going to start with the standalone first. So I'm going to go ahead and click that icon. And then as that's booting, I'm going to go back to confer because um, I realize I'm going to need to share that with you. All you're going to see is a blank screen. So. Um, let me go back to confer and change my sharing settings. I really hate this. Oh, come on. Bridge is not coming up as an application. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Okay, I'm going to have to share the desktop, which I hate doing because it makes everything so small. Let's see how bad that looks. All right, that's pretty teeny. Hopefully this will work. I've really lowered the resolution of my monitor to try to make this work. All right. So here's an idea of what this application looks like. And it, it has several different ways that we can view the files. Um, we've got all of these modes up here in this drop down menu. And I believe that when you open up Bridge for the very first time, Essentials is what you see first. So let me let it change its configuration here. You can see that it's partitioned into several different areas. Always the top left corner is allowing you to navigate through your computer or your network, whatever it may be. So I have my internal drive on my laptop right here, OS C, which is what most of us are used to seeing on a PC. And on the Macintosh, you would see whatever the name of your Macintosh drive is. And then I have an external drive here called my Passport. 
And I can also open that up and navigate through it. And if I was attached to a network, I would also see that network connection in this area. So this is my navigation area. To the right of it is all of the folders that will be available when you click on that location. So currently I have my desktop selected. And what I'm seeing are all of my shortcuts and all of my folders that are sitting on that top level. And Bruce's Alaska pictures are here. So I'm going to open that file. And I see the thumbnails of all of these eagle pictures. So here is my content. And again, I can change how these appear by these little panel menus, which should be familiar to you guys. In the um, uh, in as an InDesign student, because we're used to that little icon that means that it's a panel menu. So we've got the choice of horizontal, horizontal, vertical, or auto, and I can move these sections, these partitions around. So if you hover over any of the little partitions, and there's a little tiny icon, like a little double bar, I can shrink that so that I can get more room over to the right. And if I click on an image, the preview will come up in this preview window. And again, I may, I may want more room for that preview, or I may want to bring up the information portion. And it's phenomenal how much information you can get from a camera. So it's telling me that this was shot with an f-stop of 4 at 1, 1,250. It's giving me the ISO, what it was shot in. I know for a fact that these were shot in Camera Raw. So if I go into Camera Raw, it's giving me the raw file name. You know, It's white balance temperature. It's, it's unbelievable what I'm able to garnish from this. I can also input keywords so that and I don't know if you guys are all familiar with the term metadata. But metadata is information that goes along with the file that is not visible in the view of the file. So for example, all I see in this image is this beautiful picture of this eagle looking back over his shoulder. And yet, all of this information is available to me. And it, is, it goes with that file. So in a, along with this type of embedded metadata that comes automatically with the camera and with the processing that you do in Photoshop, you can also add keywords to this metadata. So if you're someone who's dealing with thousands of photographs, this is going to be the way you're going to be able to sort these things. Because you may have you know, 1,000 pictures for Paris. But in addition to Paris, you want to be sure that these are ones that have to do with the Eiffel Tower or some other feature of Paris. And then you can use Bridge to help you sort through it. All right, I'm going to bring this back down so I can get my eagle a little bit bigger. Another very cool feature here is this thing called a collection. And it looks like a little folder, a file folder that has the um, string that you attach to the back. You can put files from multiple locations on a network or a hard drive and drag them into a collection without changing their position in any of their root locations. So for instance, I could go to a folder and I could drag this picture into this collection. Then I could go to another folder on my drive and put that in. And then at any point, I can take a look at that collection and I can see right now I have three photos here. And yet they are in different places on my hard drive or on my network. So it's a great place to collect ideas before you maybe move them into a physical location where they share the same information. All right, I want to go back here. We have a lot of other options in here. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but um, you've got all kinds of things about recent. And here's my little boomerang, which is going to return me back to uh, InDesign. I've got an option to help me get photos from a camera. This little spindle is really important because if you shoot your pictures on a digital camera in what we call camera raw, 
this is how you're going to be able to process them. You're going to have to open up Bridge, and then you're going to open these in Camera Raw, and then save them to a format that Photoshop is going to be able to see. And I'm not going to go into any more details on that. I do want to show you a couple of additional windows here. So we have Essentials. We have Film Strip. So all of that data got crunched over here into this corner so that I can go through and easily click on a photo that I'm interested in. Another one I really like is Preview because it lets me really focus on that preview of an image that I want to look at. And then I have the option of taking these thumbnails. I can shrink these down with this sizing bar here. I'm going to bring these down a little bit so I can see them a little bit easier. Okay. So if, if I was you and you can just take some time, really play around in Bridge. Um, another thing that's really cool, and I, I wish I would have set this up sooner and I didn't. So let me, um, uh, let's see. Let me go into a training folder really quick. And if it's all blurry, don't worry. I will tell you as soon, I will slow down as soon as I get someplace that actually has something worth looking at. So here are two PDFs. In fact, I'm going to upload these tomorrow morning for you guys. These, this is your Macintosh and your PC keyboard equivalent sheets. Notice I am not in Acrobat right now. I'm not in any type of a PDF viewer, and yet I can see these files. And if I go back, uh, let me go to InDesign CS5 really quickly, because I know I have some training files in here. Um, let's see here. So here's a file. And let me slow down for just a sec to make sure you guys have a chance to see the preview. I'm going to bring this up a little bit here. And I can see that this is a two-page InDesign file right here, one of two pages. And I have an arrow that lets me go back and forth between these pages. And yet, as we can see, I'm in Bridge. I am not in InDesign. And this is going to be true for Illustrator, for Photoshop, any of these Adobe applications. When Bridge first came out many versions ago, a lot of us didn't jump on the bandwagon because it was so slow. But Adobe has made significant progress with this. And if you are into photography, it is just an awesome tool. And if you are someone who has to deal in InDesign with lots, lots of assets, whether those are Photoshop files, Illustrator files, whatever they may be, this is a great place to be able to visually figure out where things are. One of the things that happens quite often is you are looking at pictures that have uh, file names like 103544.jpg. What does that mean when you're looking at it within your finder? And this is a way that you can go in and say, oh yes, that's exactly the picture I want. And here's the next step. How do I get this picture into InDesign? Well, we can drag, I'm going to go back to my desktop here and back into these Eagle photos. I can drag an image directly from Bridge into InDesign. But that's not going to be very easy for me right now because it's covering up InDesign. So this isn't really a viable option for me. But I have this little button up here, and I, I hope you guys can see the little pop-up that says Switch to Compact Mode. I'm going to click, and it becomes a little tiny window. and there's InDesign peeking out from behind. So now I'm going to go down to this next spread. And I'm going to bring in that image of the eagle here. So I click on the image, drag over into my InDesign window, let go, 
and it gives me my cursor preview, which now I can just go ahead and drag. And now I've got my eagle. So this is a really nice way to be able to use both of these applications at the same time. Now there's another way we can do this. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close the application for the moment. And I'm going to go to my window menu. Because remember, your window menu is the home to all of your panels. So I'm going to go down here about two-thirds of the way down, and notice we have this option called Mini Bridge. And when it comes up, which is not. Try that again. Oh, great. I was just working with this a minute ago. Isn't that lovely? I just love how everything changes when I load into Confer. I do not see it on my second monitor either. Hang on. Let's try this again. That is so amazing that I am not seeing it. Oh, man. Just what I wanted. Let me see if I'm having problems with any of my other panels just for a second. Okay, so there's my flattener preview. Let's try another one. Let's try my liquid layout. Got that. So where is that hiding? Let's try this way. Let me launch Bridge again. Hide it and see if it'll come on screen. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe this. I do not want to log out of this and log back in because I don't want to lose you guys. Okay, let's suffice it to say, I don't know why something is inhibiting the panel from coming up. And the only difference between a few minutes ago and now is that um, I'm logged on to confer. So, mini bridge, let me simulate this the best I can, okay? Um, let me bring up bridge and compact mode. And what, what this panel will look like is it will come up like this, like a panel, except it will be, it will have this color shading, like hyperlinks or whatever. You can dock it just like any other panel, and it will look very similar to this compact mode. All right. Sorry about that. I have a, an appointment with, um, with tech support tomorrow to see if we can iron out some of the problems that I'm having with Confer. Um, and we'll see if this gets any better. All right. All right, I'm going to do a couple things on this page with this compact mode and let's just pretend that I'm in the um, <laughs> let's pretend that I'm in mini bridge, just lovely. And um, I'm gonna do a couple things with this photo that I think is really fun. I'm trying to bring up one fun thing a week that in addition to how fun I think all of these features are, just something that is out of the ordinary and something that people would like to do. This image, I'm going to go ahead and put text wrap around it by clicking on the image and then clicking on the wrap and then moving 
some space around it, creating a buffer. And that's all well and good, but this eagle has all of this space on the left, the top, and the right. And it might look kind of nice in a circle. So I want to show you guys how you can get a photo into any other kind of shape. I'm just going to minimize that for the moment. So I drew a circle over here on my pasteboard area. And this is exactly what is great about the pasteboard areas, because this is where you can play with things. I just took my circle frame tool, my ellipse tool, and I drew a circle holding down my shift key. Let me let that refresh. And then I gave it a stroke and so on and so forth. So what I'm going to do is go over here to my eagle, place my cursor towards the center so that I see the hand, which is telling me that I'm in my content grabber, even though it's not showing up on the screen. And I'm going to copy that image, select my circle, and then choose Paste Into. And there my eagle is in this shape. Now I can also click on a shape, and I can change its shape by going to the Object menu. But for right now, I'm just going to go ahead and I can see that I've got white space at the top of that circle, white space at the bottom. And I'm just going to increase the size of this. And I'm doing that by going up to my Scale commands on my Control Panel, holding down my Shift key so that it will go faster. And I just want to get it big enough so that I know the top and the bottom are outside of that circle. And I also want to be sure that my link connecting the vertical versus the horizontal is intact so that I see 60 and 60. I don't want this to get skewed in any way. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and just click on this one and get rid of it and drag this one into place. And add text wrap. But because this is a, a round image, I don't want to use the uh, bounding box because no matter what shape something is, notice that I have this blue bounding box. So bounding boxes are always going to create a box around the leftmost edge, top, right, and bottommost edge of an image. And if I do bounding box, that's not going to look very good. I'm going to get this wrap. It's going to create this white space, and that doesn't look very cool. So I'm going to go to the next button, which is text, which is wrap around the shape. And that works, but the text is butting up against the image. So I'm going to go in and give myself a little space here, maybe eight or nine points to, do, to create some white space around this. And then I'm going to Try to center that, maybe bring it down just a couple of lines. And there I've got my eagle peeking out of a round circle with a nice brown edge around that frame. I'm going to go back into Bridge or Mini Bridge, whichever one you happen to have open, and say, well, maybe I'd like this picture down here in the bottom left-hand corner. So I'm going to drag it over. I can see that plus sign attached to my cursor. When I let go of my mouse, it gives me my thumbnail preview. And I'm going to drag. Wow, this is really giving me a problem here. I'm going to drag across. You can see the snowflakes. Here, he, the snow he's dragged up from his claws, which is just so amazing. And I'll go back to text wrap. And in this case, I have a square image, so I'm probably going to use the square bounding box. And if it was me, I, I don't want a widow or an orphan, a, a single line above or below something, so I'm going to size that up just a little bit so that it is about the same height as the text over here. 
Okay. When you import these images, you import them by default as a linked file. When you import images, it does not embed those images in your InDesign file. That means that if you take this InDesign file that you're working on and you put it on a USB drive or you put it up into Dropbox and you download it to another computer or you copy it to another computer, that file is not going to come with the font or the images because the fonts have to be resident on a person's machine unless you package the file. And we will be getting into packaging next week. And the images are linked. So how do I know what image is missing, what images has been um, modified? And this is what your links panel does for you. And your links panel usually shows by default it shares that same panel grouping as pages and layers. This is your central control station that tells you everything about what you have imported. So I'm going to go ahead and click on this. And you can see that this demo file has so many images. Because this is the same one I keep building on as the semester is progressing. And at first it's overwhelming. You think to yourself, you know, how am I going to find anything here? Well, this panel gives you so much information and so many options to help you figure out what to do. We're going to talk about these little alerts here in just a moment. But for exa example, let's say that I'm looking at this and I think, okay, wait a minute, Antelope Canyon, Antelope Canyon. Where did I use that? Well, I can see it's on page 6. But if I have multiple images on page 6, which I do, how am I going to know which one is this particular Antelope Canyon? Well, if I go down to the bottom, I have several icons running across the bottom. And one of them is take me to the link. And when I click, it takes me directly to that image, and I know that this is the one that I selected, which will refresh your memory, and you'll think to yourself, oh, right, okay, that's what I needed, and I'll go on from there. We also have several other um, options here. One of them, this little pencil on the right, allows you to edit that image in its source file. But just a little word of warning. That's usually going to work all right with Illustrator files if you have Illustrator loaded on your system. But for Photoshop files, it may not. On Windows, the default rasterized image preview is just that JPEG previewer thing that it's a Windows previewer. So when I click my pencil button, depending on what update I've had done on my Windows machine, and this is true for the Mac too. It probably sometimes comes up in preview. Instead of clicking on the pencil, I end up having to select the image, and I either right-click on it or control-click on the Mac and go down to Edit With, and then I choose the application I want to edit it with. Or um, I can go to the Links panel menu, and I get that same menu option, Edit With, and then you can override the default. The other way you can get around this is if you go into your operating system preferences, you can tell your operating system that if you have a rasterized image, it's supposed to open it up in Photoshop instead of previewing it. Now, the, the downside of that is that if you double click on a JPEG, let's say, that someone has given you, instead of opening it up in the preview for you to see a nice big image, it will take the time to boot up Photoshop. And sometimes that's not what I want. I don't want to edit in Photoshop. I just want to see it. And I don't necessarily want to have to open up Bridge to do that. So how you deal with that is, is up to you. OK. Um, let's go back. Oh, let's talk about a couple other things. I'm going to still click on this cantaloupe. Notice this antelope, not cantaloupe, antelope canyon. When you click on an image, the bottom half gives you lots of information about that image. And there's a bar separating the list of images from information about that image. And we went into this in an earlier webcast in a little bit of detail. But I want to talk a little bit more about this. We talked about it with actual PPI versus effective PPI, which is pixels per inch, which is 
going to give you or tell you the resolution that you have for a particular image. Notice there's lots of other metadata down here. You know, the author is Patrick Mahoney. That's my friend who took this particular picture. This is the path where it sits on my hard drive. What's its scale? Does it have transparency? So there's lots of information that's going to help you figure out what type of problem you may have in your file, or you just needed to know the size of it, and you needed to know the resolution, you needed to know the color space. This is RGB color space. If I'm printing in CMYK, this tells me I either need to export this as a PDF that will convert RGB to CMYK, or I need to go into Photoshop and change its color mode. If you modify an image that's linked to an InDesign file in Photoshop, you will get a little triangle, a little yellow triangle, that tells you that that file has been modified. And these are under your status column here. So you can see I've got a little triangle up here with an exclamation point. And if I look straight down, these are my little alerts. I have the option of sorting these items by, for instance, right now they're in file name A to Z. If I click this little triangle right here, very teeny triangle, it will sort them from Z to A. If I want to know if I'm having any problems, I've got any alerts, I can click on the triangle and it will bring all the alerts to the top so that I can address the problem that I have here. And if I want to sort them by their location in the document, I can click on this here, this icon that looks like a little page. You also have the option of going to your panel options command in the links panel drop down menu. And this allows me to decide what I want shown in the panel, the uh, little panel columns, versus what's being shown in this bottom location. So notice show in link info, which is the bottom half of the panel. All of these items are turned on until I get way down here to aperture, shutter, ISO speed, and those are not turned on. That would increase the amount of information quite a bit. But I have the option of turning those on. Notice in the show column, which is what would happen here, this is where it would be displayed, all I have showing is name, status, and the page. If I added one of these others, it would create an additional column. And if you need that information on an ongoing basis, go ahead and do that. That's a great idea. I tend to not add too many columns because then I have to pull this panel out in order to see all of that. And I'm trying to keep this panel down to a manageable size. All right, I need to find out what image is missing. So I'm going to click on the image, tell it to take me to the link, and it's telling me that my eagle that's looking over the back of his head is missing. Now even though it can't find the linked file, InDesign is going to keep a low res preview of the last version of the image that it had access to. But if I tried to print this right now to a high resolution printer, it would look pretty bad because it's, it can't go out, find the file, and get the, the actual file information. Notice too that when I'm not in preview mode, that same icon, this is brand new in six, uh, CS6, is sitting right here on the frame. So I need to figure out when I see this, and this happens quite often, you, you haven't worked on a file in a while, you all of a sudden open it up and you notice, oh man, I've got these missing files. So I need something to jog my memory. And often what I do is I go down to my link information, I pull this way out so I can see the path, and I see, all right, this was in my week four folder. What did I do with that information? Oh, right. I ended up putting it on the desktop so that I could get to those files easier. So I click on the image, and I go to the panel menu, and we've got three different relinks that we have available to us. One is just relink, and it's going to bring up a browser window asking me to go find where that image now sits. But if I moved an entire folder of images, which is exactly what I did, I can also choose relink to folder, 
and then click on that folder and it will go and look for all the file names. And I can do that also with file extensions. Sometimes we have JPEGs and then we replace them with the exact same file name, but they have a PSD extension, meaning it's a Photoshop file. And we are allowed to import native Photoshop and native Illustrator and PDF files. And in fact, in many cases, that's the preferable way to import files. So you may just need to say, oh, by the way, it's the same file name. Just change the extension from JPEG to TIFF or EPS, whatever it may be. I'm going to go ahead and click the relink button. And I'm going to navigate to my desktop and look for these images. And the one I'm looking for is the eagle. I click on the image, click open, and in the, even though I did not, um, even though I did not say relink to folder, InDesign is smart enough to say, oh, by the way, when I was in that folder, I noticed that sharing the same directory were three other images that were missing. So I linked them for you again. Thank you very much. Took care of that. And I look now through here, and I only have one more that I've got a problem with. So let's just take a look what its full name is. And this is 4750. Let's go figure out where that image is. And it's this one right here. And when I I don't know if you guys saw that, but when I let me cancel that. When I clicked on the little stop sign here, the red one, it brought up the relink dialog without me having to go up to the links panel. And I believe I replaced that with a let me see what I did here. I think I replaced that with a um let me look at this a little bit different way. Oh, where is my go to details? I'm looking for four seven five zero. Can you guys see just in what I'm going through how nice Bridge is? Yeah, that's the one I want. So I'm going to click open, and I went into Photoshop and I turned this into a duotone. So it was an extension change, and I just relinked it to a completely different file. So that's another thing you can do with the relink. You look at a file that's missing and you think to yourself, oh right, I threw that away a week ago. That was an old one. We've replaced that now with a new file. So you don't necessarily have to relink to the same file. You can, be re you can relink it to an entirely different file if you want to. Now what um, didn't work for me here is I had done a setup of a file that I changed in Photoshop while InDesign was closed. So if, if I go into one of these files and I change it in Photoshop and then I open up InDesign again, I'm going to get a little yellow triangle. And that tells me that InDesign can find the image. It's not having a problem with that, but it notices that the image has been changed since the last time I looked at it in InDesign. And it doesn't automatically update it for you because you may not want it to update. So you just go through and you just click on either the yellow icon that will sit right in that same column as that little red stop sign, or you'll see a little yellow triangle up in the corner of the image. And you can just click on that and it automatically just updates it with the new version of the file. The question I get more than any other question with images are students saying to me, but how do I embed it? I don't want it linked. Because they are so used to the workflow of Microsoft Word where people just embed their images in a Microsoft Word file and then they can take that file anywhere they go and all the images are in there. And that's great for Microsoft Word, but it's not a great way for a workflow in InDesign. And it's not a great way because Often in InDesign, we are working with images that are much bigger. And when you embed an image in InDesign, which you're allowed to do, I hate to even tell you guys this because I know everybody's going to want to jump off and say, well, I'm going to embed my images. <laughs> Let's say that you're working for, um, you're doing some sort of really nice InDesign file. 
those images can be 10 and 20 megabytes apiece, 30 megabytes, maybe even 40 or 50 megabytes, because they're, they're very high quality with very high resolution. Every time you embed an image, it increases the size of your InDesign file by the size of that image. You know, you've got 30 or 40 images, you're talking about your file size just exponentially growing, which means that it's going to be a slower file. It's not going to respond as quickly. So that's why we link. The, the other good thing about linked images is that when you modify those images, they automatically can be relinked. You don't have to re-import them again. What if you had 30 images in a file and you had to re-import every one of those images during the editing process? And I'll guarantee you that if you are in a work environment, most images are going to be changed some way because somebody in the art department or in the graphics department is going to say, oh, no, we, we needed this eagle tip of this feather to be worked on or we needed it to be, you know, instead of this color space, one of this color space. I don't want to have to re-import all of these and resize them. I'd rather just update the images or point to a new folder of images. Because remember, what you're seeing here in InDesign is not really the full image. You are seeing a low resolution thumbnail. And even though we go to high display performance, which we have discussed over and over again, you're, you're seeing a, a better improved. But remember, we're looking at a device on a monitor that has a resolution of anywhere from 72 to 96 pixels per inch. And when we're looking at something on paper, we are looking at something that has thousands of pixels per inch. So this is why we're able to get away with this on the screen. And then it also enables us to work much quicker. You know, I can take this file and move my page very fast. And for me, there was no refresh. Now, of course, for you there is because we're going through a, obviously a, an upload and a download for you to see it. And I hope I've convinced you guys. It's, you, are, um, just, you are not going to want to embed your photos. Now, if you have to send a document over to Europe to get translated, this is the one place where I find people often embed low resolution images to so the translation house has access to those images without having to know how to get them in there. So let me show you how you do that if you really want to. You can click on an image and go to the links panel. And you choose the command embed link. But I would really recommend that if you do that, you embed a low resolution, resolution link so that it's just for the purpose of someone being able to get an idea of what that photo looks like so that they can do whatever they have to um, in the text. If you want to send a document out for review, you're not going to want to send this out in InDesign format anyway. And next week we're going to be focusing on workflows. What you're going to want to do is create a PDF. And if it's for someone who just needs to review the file, you want to you want to put a low resolution PDF up there so they can just comment on it, send you back the comments so that you can make the edits. You don't want other people monkeying around with your InDesign file, believe me. Or you want to create a very high resolution PDF that's going to be sent to a printer. And most printers today do not take the InDesign files. They are printing from PDF for lots of reasons that we'll talk about next week. All right. Um, fixing missing links. We did that. Oh, one other thing. Let me just go over this. I'm looking at my notes. Um, couple things here. I don't know how clear this is going to be, but can you see that there's a link here under my pointer? And then there's an indent. And you see that there are two occurrences of this image in the same file. And in the last couple of versions, InDesign has categorized these so that you can see there's really only one image that's linked, but it's been placed in the file in two different locations, one on page 20 here and one on page 22. So if I had, let's say, a logo on every single page, 
the logo would be listed in the links panel once, and then I would see all of the occurrences in that file indented like a list going down. If that logo loses its connection or it gets updated, you don't have to update each individual occurrence here. Like I don't have to click on this one and say update and this one update. All you have to do is click on the parent, so the one that's furthest out to the left that has the little drop down menu next to it, and you would update this one and of course all occurrences would update. Another option, um, looking for this here, let's see. Let's say that um, I click on an image and I don't remember where I got that image. Because I may have pulled one image from a file server, another one from a USB drive that's plugged in, another one from an another external drive, and then another one from my C drive or my root, dri my root drive on my uh, laptop or my tower. Of course I can go down to this bottom information, drag this out, follow the link, the path, telling me where it is. But another option I have is to click on that image, go to my links panel, and just choose reveal in, and on the Mac it will say either finder or whatever it's the name for the operating system. And then if you were in a Windows machine it will say something like reveal and explore. And when I let go of that, it will open up the folder that's containing those images. And when you're pulling images from all kinds of locations, this is really a helpful way to figure out where something is. And when we get into packaging next week, we're going to talk about how InDesign allows you to take an InDesign file and you can go out and say, okay, go find every image that's being used in this file, make a copy of it, put it into a directory, put all the fonts that are being used in this file in a directory, make a copy of the InDesign, add it to that same directory, and you get this nice clean little folder that has an InDesign file, all your fonts, and all of your images so that you can send this off to a printer. This was something that was, um, has been in Cork Express since day one. And of course, Adobe knew that this was really important. I just wish I had this option in so many other applications that I work with. Because if you've been working on a project for two weeks to six months, and you have, like I said, you have pulled all these images from different locations, you have replaced images. I also use this method for cleaning house. And, and I'm, like I said, I'm going to go into a lot more detail about this next week. All right, if I have just a couple minutes left, I want to, do I have time to do this? Let's see. I want to talk just a moment about opening files. Um, it's something that should be covered this week, but I just have not had time to get to it in all of the webcasts we've had. When you use the open command, um, all of you have done obviously an open and an InDesign file. But the open command is going to open up an INDD file for an InDesign file, an INDT, InDesign template file, INDL, which means that it's a file that can be opened up from CS4 going forward. And it will also open up a file called an INX file. INX files were what we used to open up file versions previous to CS3. And this is why if you have to save out an InDesign file to someone who's using CS3, it is a huge pain in the neck because the file format changed at CS4. So from CS6, you can do a save as to an INDL file. Then you would have to open that up in a CS4 version to save it out as a CS3 version. And that is not going to be fun because you're going to have to find three different machines, I mean three different versions on there. So that's not a great thing to have to do. The open command will also allow you to open up Quark Express documents from version 3.3 to 4.1. There are also several third-party programs that will convert a Quark Express document to an InDesign document. So um, if you are 
in the if you were at a company where you were trying to change a history of Cork Express documents over to InDesign, like I said, up to 4.1 you can do it, but we are way past, way past that in Cork Express. So you'll probably need to invest in a third party um, program. When you open a file, as I said, and someone did not package the images or the fonts, one of the first things you're going to see when you open up that file is an alert message that says, you have X number of images missing and you have X number of fonts missing. If you click that you want to see that those fonts that are missing, it will take you directly to this command called type find fonts. This is what you will see when you um, click on that message. If you just say fine, I don't need to see it, it will go on and show you your page. But what is going to happen is everywhere text is using a missing font on your system, you are going to see text with a pink background. And often people will call me and say, why does my text have this pink background? This is a preference you can change, but I like it because it's a really ugly pink. It's a pink you would never want to use in your file. And it alerts you immediately to the fact that you've got a problem. And if you go into your fonts when it tells you you have some missing, you can look in here and you'll see a, a little <clears throat> excuse me, a little yellow triangle or a red sign that will show you that you are missing a particular font. And then you can deal with it. You can either go find that font and load it, or if it's a font you never plan on owning, you can just go down to the replace with and you can change every occurrence of that particular font to something else. So I could say, okay, I have Critter in here. I want to change every occurrence to Minion Pro Regular. And you can click Change All. If those fonts have been included in a paragraph definition, a paragraph style, all of those styles will then have a local override, which is not something you want. And if you want this to be a permanent change to your template or your file going forward, then you're going to want to make sure that this little checkbox, redefine style, is selected. Don't worry about remembering this right now. I will go into this again when we get heavily into paragraph and character styles, because this is going to be a really important point. All right. Um, I don't really have time. To, I want to make sure we close at 8 o'clock the way we're supposed to. Um, at the next webcast, I will try to include a quick a little spiel on the print dialog. I hate to get into too much detail on the print dialog just because every printer has different options. But especially if anyone has questions about the InDesign the basic InDesign print dialog. I want to go over some of the items and where you can find some solutions to maybe some problems that you're having. Okay. I think that's it for tonight. I have a record of everybody who joined the class. So um, I will, I'm keeping track of all of you guys and putting you on a list. Thank you. And if anybody wants to go ahead and uh, sign off, it's fine. And if anybody wants to stay around for any questions, please feel free to do so. But I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording at this point. All right, thank you everybody.